Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is the Ecofim webinar series at SAC Business School in Paris, and I am Andrea Roncoroni, director of the Ecofim Center. So today, uh, Alex Young is presenting uh, a paper on capacity expansion in service platforms, ownership, commitment, and flexibility. Thanks for joining us, uh, Alex. Alex uh, is an associate professor of management science and operations at the London Business School. He received a bachelor degree from Tsinghua University, a master degree from Northwestern University, an MBA and the PhD at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. His research work focuses on supply chain and trade finance, fintech and interfaces of operations, finance and technology. Alex is an instructor in MBA, EMBA and executive programs as well. And he also intervenes in popular media, including Bloomberg, The Economist, Financial Times, Forbes. Alex applied his research work and consulting for international corporations such as United Airlines, Citadel, Didi, Shunqing and Alibaba Group. And as I said earlier, he's presenting a paper on capacity expansion in service platform. Thanks uh, again once more for joining us, uh, Alex. It's a pleasure to have you here. The stage is yours. Hi, great. Uh, Andrea, thank you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, I, I, I will follow the rules like uh, what, we just, um, what we just discussed. So, uh, if there is any question, please feel free to to stop me in the middle or uh, just drop me a note on the chat. I will I will monitor it periodically. And uh, as Andrea was saying, so today I'm going to present an ongoing work uh, titled uh, "Capacity Expansion in Service Platforms: uh, Ownership, Commitment, and Flexibility." And uh, so this project is. Uh, is collaborates is in collaboration with uh, Haiku Pura, who is uh, in Imperial College Business School, and uh, Haiku and I have started to work together not on this paper, well, uh, work on previous papers uh, together. Well, he was a PhD student uh, at London Business School, so I learned tremendously about uh, uh, from him, and it, it's a pleasure to uh, work on this project with him. So uh, let me very quickly uh, sort of scope a little bit of what we're trying to do in this paper. I, I think I, I probably don't need to motivate too much about service platforms. This is uh, probably the single most uh, important business model innovation over the last 20 years. Uh, but if we look at this type of on-demand service platforms, uh, the initial stage, I would say, uh, the, we call them the emergent stage. Basically, the idea is these platforms are built to exploit idle capacities. Think of uh, you have a second home uh, somewhere in the beautiful countryside in France, and but you're not using it all the time, so you may post it on Airbnb uh, to, to earn a little bit of extra money. And if you have a car, you happen to like drive a little bit, uh, a few more hours, every day, then you join Uber. So that's the sort of emergent stage. But as these platforms grow, and when there are more demand coming to these platforms, uh, we say this platform has entered uh, the expansion or the growth, uh, the growth of supply stage. Uh, basically there, we need to expand capacity in order to meet or fill further demand. So uh, a lot of, we heard a lot of motivating examples uh, even before COVID, uh, where because of the high churn in Uber, Uber was constantly looking for uh, new drivers joining the platform. And uh, one common problem for this type of driver is that sometimes they would like to join the platform and provide service, but normally they don't have the service capacity, the pro, or we think of them as the production capacity that allows them to serve on the platform. Think about uh, a car that meet uh, the specification in Uber, right? Or if you think about, uh, I'm a good chef, or uh, I used to be working in a restaurant, I want to open my own restaurant, but I don't have actually a restaurant. 
So all these type of production capacity, they are expensive and uh, so expensive such that uh, this type of uh, potential service providers do not have the financing capacity uh, to invest them. So, so that's the overall uh, sort of background. And to, so, to sort of resolve this problem, uh, we've seen a few different ways that the platforms have initiated or collaborated with other parties. Uh, the first one that got our attention actually made us start to look at this problem is uh, where Uber started to finance their new drivers in 2015. So they basically established this uh, the subsidiary called Exchange Leasing. It's a leasing company that offers long-term leases to uh, drivers who normally couldn't, don't have a, a vehicle themselves or don't have, or their personal vehicle does not meet uh, the specification required by Uber. So uh, this type of, this program actually didn't last it very long. Uh, in about 2017, uh, Uber shut down this uh, this service in the U.S. Uh, one of the controversies uh, discussed in popular media is that drivers often find the payment to be very high and it's very difficult for them to catch up with, uh, with these payments. Uh, that said, this type of uh, sort of, we call them platform financing schemes, uh, they continued, uh, they were continued in operation in emerging and frontier market, for example, in Africa, where a lot of Uber drivers are online uh, on-demand uh, service platforms. They actually, uh, they use second-handed cars, imported second-handed cars. And uh, Uber and other platforms continue providing this type of service. So that's the first mechanism we, uh, that sort of helped, uh, or at least tries to help service providers to acquire vehicle. And uh, the second sort of mechanism is uh, what we call uh, employing uh, service providers. Uh, we put the, the word employing in quotation mark because here the employment really means uh, the platform is providing the capacity, uh, providing the production capacity, and uh, in, in return, ask for an exclusive dealing type of contract from the service providers. Uh, one example will be uh, Deliveroo, uh, which I use a lot in London. So uh, Deliveroo, there are two types of service providers. So one, uh, type of service provider are those restaurants, they already have the establishment and they are just providing an additional service on Deliveroo. The other type, which is called Deliveroo ed Editions, so these are based on the dark uh, kitchen concept. The idea is uh, these type of service providers, they basically transact exclusively on Deliveroo. So all their orders are through Deliveroo and they are uh, basically using the kitchens provided by Deliveroo and they were not allowed to uh, to use other delivery companies or uh, directly selling consumers one way or the other. So that's the second mechanism. We call them uh, employment. And this type of contract is also common in uh, some uh, right hiding companies, but mostly in uh, in China, where the platforms directly employ uh, directly employ those drivers. Uh, the third mechanism that we looked at, where platforms initiated to uh, to, to sort of uh, help resolve this capacity shortage problem, is basically providing short term rental to service providers. Here I'm giving you an example of uh, Ola, which is uh, sort of the, the red hailing red hailing leader in uh, India. And they are basically providing this short-term rental from within days to a few weeks uh, to uh, the potential service providers. And they will basically run the vehicle and uh, then drive on Ola, drive on Ola. So, 
if uh if we look at these three uh sort of mode right we have financing the service provider so that the service provider acquires and owns the production capacity and we have two other uh sort of mechanisms one is employment one is rent in both of these two mechanisms uh, the service uh, the the platform actually acquires and own uh, the capacity think about a vehicle right in this case uh, ola will own the fleet and uh, they are basically providing this uh, uh, production capacity to the service provider one way or the other so with the observation of uh, these three mechanisms uh, in this paper, we're, we're hoping to understand basically how should a service platform expand its capacity uh, and attract new providers. Uh, more specifically, we ask uh, these three questions. Uh, should the platform finance uh, provider's investment in, in the service asset or should they invest in this asset themselves? Right? This uh, corresponds to the ownership part who should hold the ownership of the service asset. And then uh, we ask, should the platform secure long-term supply where employment or use uh, rental to preserve uh, provider flexibility, right? If we think about for long-term supply, I basically need to agree with the service provider how much I'm paying them uh, way in advance. Well, for rental, I can basically play with the hourly rate both for the service and for the rental. And that preserves more flexibility for, for both parties. Uh, the final question is, we're going to have a horse race between these three mechanisms and see what factors influences uh, the, pro the platform's optimal choice uh, between among this, uh, these three mechanisms. Alex. Right. Yes. Just, uh, just a Please, quick Andrew. question. Are, are these two alternatives uh, one a totally alternative to the other, or we can have a mix? Ah, so, uh, in in this case, in, in this uh, paper, we are looking at uh, sort of these three independently. Or they are like alternative options instead of looking at through a portfolio. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that's a great question. Right now, we're actually, uh, we're revising the paper. Uh, we are not going to, uh, as I'll show you, so in the version I presented, there are still some, uh, some technical sort of restrictions that we're working with. And the model is, is because of this multi-stage and there are multiple pro, pro, potential service providers, uh, the model is actually quite evolved. And uh, so because of that, we, we have to make some some technical uh, choice, choice, okay. modeling choice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, with this, uh, so, so basically for the interest of time, I'm going to, not going to go into a, a in-depth uh, literature review, but basically this uh, literature, uh, li this paper is related to uh, the platform, uh, sort of platform design and mechanism and uh, operations literature, uh, which has been contributed by uh, operations pro operations uh, 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 researchers, strategy uh, scholars, and uh, economists. And uh, we are also related to the large literature on operations management under financial constraints. So in our case, uh, the operation management side is that we're looking primarily on how the platform will expand their capacity, grow their supply side, right? We are relatively simplistic in terms of the demand side. And in terms of financial constraints, uh, it's basically closely tied to our motivation that this type of service providers, well, they have the labor, they have the time, or the skill to provide service, they don't have the financing capability. Uh, so that is the financial constraint part. That is the financial constraint part. So uh, with this, uh, so here is a quick outline of uh, the talk. Uh, so we've done with the introduction part, 
And then we're going to start by looking at what we call service provider ownership mechanisms. That includes the benchmark bank financing model and then the platform financing model. Then we're going to change gears and look at uh, the two mechanisms under which the platform owns uh, the service asset. So that will be employment and rental. And then after individually analyzing these mechanisms, we're going to sort of compare uh, what is, and figure out what is the optimal uh, mechanism for, for platform service expansion. And after that, we're going to talk about two uh, extensions. Uh, one of them being the application of minimum wage uh, regulation, and the other is uh, the indirect network effect, which will basically more closely link uh, supply and demand. Right. So uh, with this, let me uh, first jump into the model. Uh, so, so basically the service provider ownership mechanism. Uh, so in our model, there are these uh, few types of uh, players. The first one is uh, have a platform. Uh, this platform is the one that we think that are already in the growth or expansion stage. So we assume relative, at least relative to the potential service providers, uh, they are financially unconstrained. So in the base model, we assume they face a simple linear demand curve. Uh, which is basically the intercept alpha minus uh, the fee or the price they charge on their customers. So alpha minus P is the demand. On the supply side, the platform is deciding uh, on uh, wage W, which is uh, the fee it pays to the supplier per unit of demand that the supplier satisfies. A crucial assumption here is uh, this basically reflects sort of the dynamic feature in uh, on-demand service platforms. We assume this wage W cannot be committed in the long run, right? So I cannot tell my Uber, as a Uber, I cannot tell my driver that for next month, uh, if you drive at noon in Paris, I'll offer you uh, this particular rate. And uh, the platform basically adjusts P and W to uh, so that demand and supply matches and they maximize their own profit. So then we have two types of service providers. Uh, the one is uh, what we call incumbent service providers. So they already own the assets, right? So th they are not sort of the highlight of our model. So we capture them in the aggregate model. Uh, in aggregate, we assume aggregated together, uh, these type of service providers uh, will provide a service, uh, a supply curve. They're basically captured by a supply curve where the total supply is proportional to the wage uh, that the platform set, right? And uh, what is more important in our model is the potential new service providers. Right, we capture them in the continuum with map Q. And they are considered to be penniless. And uh, so basically they have no uh, uh they have they have no internal capital that they could use uh to finance uh, the service capacity, uh which actually costs the C. So they need to figure out either they will borrow uh from the bank or from the platform. Right, uh, to capture sort of the risk related to this investment, uh, we assume that uh, these potential new service providers are actually generate a certain output. Uh, th this captures the fact that some of those service providers, they have family obligations, some of them, uh, they have some health uh, reasons precisely because of which they couldn't actually take on a regular job. So we aggregate all these things and we capture them as a certain output. And uh, another salient feature related to the potential new service providers is that they are self-scheduled, meaning that once they observe the wage W, at the same time, they also observe uh, an outside option, which has a uh, 
sort of a random valuation for them. So basically they will compare the wage and the outside option and decide whether I'm going to serve on the platform or I'm just going to go with my outside option. And uh, the final component, the final player in the model is the financial institutions, or we just call loosely, we call them banks. So uh, they are assumed to be uh, operating in a competitive uh, environment so that they offer break-even price. It basically means they're, uh, they expected payment they expect to receive from, uh, from their loans equals to the principal of the loan. And uh, we also assume there's no information asymmetry. So everybody observe, everybody uh, knows all these uh, all these parameters. Everybody observes all these parameters. Uh, with this model, here is the, the the timeline of the supply ownership model. So we largely uh, largely uh, classify the model the, the 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 timeline into two stages. The first stage is the investment stage where the platform or the bank is going to offer financing and the new providers decide whether to invest in uh, uh to divide to whether to invest in capacity in this asset or not then once those decisions are made in the operational stage the platforms actually set the wage level they set w and the provider's outside options are realized and they will decide whether to serve the platform thus earning W or serve their outside market. Uh, the, sorry, the, the outside option. Then the provider will work at the realized labor output. Even with it, sometimes they could work, sometimes they couldn't. Uh, finally, uh, once they have collected the fees and uh, the weight, they will pay back the loan either to the platform or to the bank. Uh, with this, uh, before I move down to the results, is there any questions that I, I can answer that or some any clarifications? All good? All right, thank you. So uh, with this, let, let me uh, quickly sort of uh, provide you with some high level results. I'm sort of subsuming all the technicality in the uh, uh, in the presentation, but I'm hope to uh, I'm I'm happy to discuss that uh, sort of offline or, or uh, after I'm done with the sort of laying out the main results. So basically, we first looked at we first look at a benchmark, which is bank financing. Right? in this case, the platform is not actively engaged in the investment stage. So in this case, the bank finances the new service providers if it can break even in anticipation of the operational stage outcomes, basically the wage, right? And uh, the platform, once the investment is in place, the platform is going to set the wage to maximize its operational profits. So based on this, you can see that this type of sequence First, the agent is going to make investment decision, and then the principal is going to make their uh, their own operational decision, which affects the agent's outcome. In this type of setting, so we uh, clearly have a holdout problem, right? And because of this holdout problem, this leads to two forms of inefficiency uh, relative to a, a centralized uh, decision making decision maker. Right, we have underinvestment, which means in some when the investment uh cost it as is at relatively high but not super high stage, is optimal for the centralized decision maker to invest, but in the uh, in the presence of the hold up, the service provider will not invest because he will realize that once I invest. Once the investment is in place, the platform is going to exploit uh, this as my vulnerability and they're going to lower the wage. If they do that, then uh, it really doesn't make economic sense for me to invest, right? And so that's the first form of inefficiency under investment. The second form of uh, inefficiency is what we call underutilization 
which basically means the platform will set the wage lower than the first best benchmark so that, uh, yeah, and because the wage is set lower, the service providers would actually at some time prefer to serve their outside option instead of uh, going with uh, serving on the platform, even when serving on the platform creates more value uh, overall to the ecosystem, right? Uh, with this as a benchmark, uh, we move to uh, platform financing, uh, where the first scenario we look at is, if we look at a simple loan, we call them interest rate only loan. And uh, in this case, uh, we show that the platform actually set the wage uh, by taking consideration of the loan uh, repayments. So in this case, the wage actually increases in loan repayment, right? Because the platform doesn't want, uh, the platform wants to keep in mind that the service providers will not provide service if they're going to go default uh, altogether. So because of that, they're going to increase their wage. And, but on the other hand, the platform is going to set their interest rate, anticipating this wage decision, which means higher wage, I'm going to set higher interest rate. Higher meaning higher than bank financing. And they're basically going to, by doing that, they're basically extracting surplus from the service providers uh, through the financing instrument they provide. And this sort of echoes uh, the anecdotal evidence that we observed uh, saying uh, when these drivers borrow from uh, Uber, their interest rate are actually quite high. So there, of course, could be other reasons, but here we're providing one possible, one possible reason. And because of this, uh, uh, we show that uh, the high interest, when we have the high interest rate, we show that when the investment cost is very low, which means the service provider could secure bank financing, uh, the service providers would actually prefer to be financed with the bank term, and this cause uh, a free writing problem. Uh, I see a question. Uh, Felix, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Uh, just a question on on that. So, when the, does it mean that uh, it's an exclusive option that they have to finance themselves, the service providers, through the platform? Because otherwise, if the wages increase, they could still and they could still choose the bank, so they could choose between bank and platform. Then they might try to you... combine the the lower interest rate from the bank with the higher wage uh, scenario. Great, great point. In this, sorry, I wasn't being clear. So in this case, the uh, the service provider actually have two options. They can choose to either finance through the bank or finance through a uh, platform. That's, uh, right. Two, this two this is this is exactly this is exactly why the free writing happens, right? So assume everybody go with a platform, then the platform will set the wage to be high. Uh, in this case, as a service provider, I will go with a bank who anticipate the high wage will give me a lower interest rate. So because of that, everybody actually prefers to go to the bank. And uh, anticipating that, the bank, then the platform is actually going to lower their wage. So this leads to a, a downward spiral and eventually, actually the whole platform collapse when, okay. the investment is, when the investment cost is low. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that's a cool, right. nice result. Great. And but what happens is when the investment cost is what we call the moderate, which is basically they are not that high, but they are high enough so that the bank wouldn't lend. Right. In this case, uh, platform financing actually works because uh, basically the service providers could not get money from the bank, could not borrow from the bank. And uh, so in this case, platform financing actually alleviates under investment. So uh, the main takeaway we say from here is uh, this type of interest rate only uh, mechanism, uh, the, the benefits is rather minimal, right? When the investment cost is low, they're not useful at all. And they're only useful when the sort of the investment cost falls in a very small uh, region. And this is actually quite a, a contrast from the other sort of 
uh, supply chain finance models that I worked with and people in the community have worked with, where they normally show that when you combine operational decision and financial decisions, uh, even simple terms, say like net term trade credit, will provide uh, a lot of uh, operational and finance uh, operational value. So in this case, we're arguing there are two dimensions of the free riding problem. One is uh, these service providers are not organized, right? So there's a coordination problem uh, among the service providers. And the other dimension is the platform couldn't, even by providing financing, it couldn't tightly tie the operational decision and the financial decision together, which means even when I finance you, could still take the asset and do something else with it, right? So motivated by this, uh, we sort of introduced another type, a more sophisticated type of contract we call uh, activity-based loan discount. So uh, how does this work is basically the platform in this case uh, still finances the service provider, but they're going to offer a payment discount when new providers serve on the platform. So this is motivated by a lot of practical observations where uh, when the service providers borrow from the platform, uh, the platform will basically uh, sort of di directly deduct if the service provider is able to directly deduct low repayment from the service provider's uh, sort of salary or wage from their account, then they will get a discount. And we show by introducing this and by optimizing the, the contract terms, this could uh, remove the incentive of uh, free writing because I only get the discount if I use this production, this service capacity on the platform, right? I could not uh, free write on my peer service providers anymore. And because of this, we can show this completely alleviate underinvestment. What in what which means that for the whole range of investment cost that the centralized service provider is willing to uh, finance or willing to invest, I could design a activity based loan discount platform uh, mechanism, which uh, the service provider will be willing to invest by themselves. And, uh, but we do find that these have some sort of unintended consequences, which is basically the, uh, by offering this low payment discount, I'm basically creating price discrimination or wage discrimination in this case between the incumbent service providers and the existing ones, right? I'm setting the wage to be low which hurts the existing service provider. But I'm setting the low payment discount to be high, which is basically providing the new service provider effectively higher wage. And uh, by doing uh, sort of by doing that, we show that through this type of discrimination, uh, we show it allows the platform to service more customers and also uh, alleviate the under investment, the under uh, utilization problem, uh, under utilization of uh, the new service uh, of the newly investment uh, asset. Right. So here is a sort of a numerical illustration of uh, the mechanism. Uh, what we can show is uh, when the C, when you can see when the investment cost the C is below CB, this is where bank financing is viable. So in this case, uh, basically simple platform financing achieves exactly the same platform profit as in bank financing. Well, discounted platform finance could actually improve their performance as uh, the investment cost goes higher. Because when the investment cost is high, Actually, it's uh, the, the probability that the service provider is going to go default goes uh, is high, and that allows the platform to provide a larger discount, and uh, this basically provides great, a greater degree of discrimination. And as we increase uh, the investment cost in the middle range, you can see that 
simple platform financing start to dominate bank financing, uh, but they sort of stop at the intermediate level, right? On the other hand, for discounted platform financing, uh, they are able to induce investment all the way up to uh, this. This is what we call the centralized uh, benchmark. So on this is not even economically uh, profitable for a centralized decision maker to to invest to invest, right? So uh, now with this, basically we looked at uh, two compare two mechanisms where. Uh, the service provider owns the asset and the platform is engaged uh, either only in the operational stage or by providing financing and engage in the operational stage. We show that by providing finance, the platform uh, in a way links uh, the operational decision and the financial decision together. And the financing uh, actually serves as sort of a um, a commitment mechanism to saying, okay, you get uh, financing from me and I will commit a higher effective wage. So that sort of alleviates uh, the ODA problem. Uh, next, we're going to look at this, uh, we're going to sort of uh, change gear. I looked at this, two, look at these two mechanisms where the platform owns the service uh, service asset. Uh, so in this case, at the investment stage, the platform is going to invest in asset. The new service provider could still opt for bank financing and the incumbent service provider work as before, right? And uh, we look at these two possible mechanisms and the employment in the financing or in the long stage, the investment stage, the platform offers a fixed salary to new service providers. If the new service provider accept, then they will work exclusively for the platform. So as you can see, through investment, uh, through uh, employment, I'm basically providing a long-term uh, commitment to the service provider regarding how much they're going to get paid. But uh, this is not without cost, right? This is not necessarily always efficient because the new service provider have to give up their offset option, uh, which sometimes could be super lucrative. On the other hand, we look at rental, uh, which means in the operating stage, the platform is going to offer both wage and uh, rental price. Oh, uh, my apologies, there, there, there should be a R. Uh, the platform offers both wage and uh, rental price and the new service provider can either rent or just simply walk away. And if you compare that with employment, a rental basically sort of provide a very weak uh, form of commitment because all the wage and rental price decision are made in the short term, right? The commitment only happens in investment state where the platform, I actually, as a platform, I actually purchases and owns the asset. Uh, another feature of the platform ownership mechanism compared to the service provider ownership uh, model is uh, what we call asset pooling. The idea is basically uh, because as a platform, I'm going to own the whole fleet, which means uh, I could pool capacities across different service providers, especially considering that these service providers have uh, uh, it's not because of their uncertain output, they're not going to use this vehicle all the time, right? So because of that, we capture the investment cost uh, using this uh, pooling parameter uh, gamma, uh, which is basically between a one and a half, which is full pooling, to one, which means there's no pooling at all. And of course, when you have pooling, we incur an inconvenience cost. For example, without having my own vehicle always parked in my uh uh like uh in front of my building, I have to walk a little bit to go to a station to pick up the vehicle, to pick up the rental vehicle, for example. And uh so with this, uh I'm going to very quickly uh lay out the 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 two the performance of these two, two separate mechanisms. 
uh, in terms of employment, we show that they basically they can alleviate uh, the whole problem by commit to a fixed salary, but it sacrifices the service providers scheduling flexibility. And because of these features, a uh, platform prefers employment over bank financing only when the market size is large uh, and when the investment cost is in the low and uh, medium stage. Uh, the large market size is easier to uh, justify because by employment, I'm basically buying all the capacity from the service providers, right? When the market size is large, then this actually, uh, uh, this capacity is not going to go waste. And that's going to be uh, helpful for me. So, so that is what's driving for, uh, for the employment result. And uh, in terms of rental, we show that the commitment, basically in the mechanism as mentioned before, the commitment is solely through asset ownership, right? All the short-term decisions are, are, are not uh, sort of committed. And uh, we show in this case, uh, what is interesting is because the ownership is already decided, the rental price is completely determined by market demand. And they are largely, they reflect, or I, mean, I should say they reflect uh, market demand and they're largely independent of uh, the investment cost. So because of this, uh, we can show that uh, platform prefers a uh, rental over bank financing when the investment cost is high, which in this case, the bank refuses, uh, basically refuses to finance. And uh, when the investment cost is uh, medium, but uh, the market size, uh, the market size is large. When the market size is large, basically I can uh, increase my rental price, and that justifies the the investment cost that I provide. And next, uh, we're going to with the analysis of these individual uh, mechanisms, we're going to look at. Uh, by comparing them, uh, again, going back to Andrea's point, we are not considering an optimal portfolio of these three mechanisms. Uh, instead, we're looking at uh, if the platform is going to provide one of these such uh, mechanisms, which one should they provide under what market conditions? Right. Uh, so at very high level, because we're comparing a lot of things, uh, we want to first look at at high level what is... Uh, what is sort of most, um, uh, what are the high level uh, uh, sort of trade off? So we have identified three dimensions, right? One is uh, in terms of flexibility for service providers. Uh, so in this case, the packing order is sort of rental provide the highest flexibility because if I don't like it, I can simply walk away without any cost. Uh, and then we have financing, which means, uh, I could still choose to go with my outside option, but bearing the investment cost. Well, the least flexible case is employment, which means I basically have no options at all. And uh, if I look at commitment, so this is an important mechanism to alleviate holdup. And in this case, we show that employment provides the highest commitment power uh, much high, uh, higher than both rental and financing, uh, which sort of alleviate uh, commitment uh, through different channels. And finally, if I think about the implication of asset ownership, uh, a big uh, advantage, uh, a big difference of uh, that is driven by asset ownership is pooling. So in this case, uh, when the platform owns the asset, uh, that is under employment and rental, they could, uh, this enables asset pooling. So that makes them sort of more beneficial or they could take advantage of pooling. Um, well, under financing, uh, the service provider could not. So uh, with this, uh, that, let me show you the sort of high level results through, uh, uh, through, through a couple of numerical examples. And we show the, uh, the sort of structural results in the paper. Uh, analytically, we show the structural results in the paper. So basically what happens is this is the no pooling case. Uh, we show in the case without pooling, 
uh, rental is actually not in the optimal consideration set, regardless of demand and investment cost. So the, the trade-off is basically between employment and financing, right? When the demand is high, then in general, when the demand is high, uh, employment is more beneficial. On the other hand, when the investment is high, uh, financing is more beneficial. This is reflected, uh, remember, in the, uh, in the first numerical example, I showed that financing is basically uh, more powerful when the cost is high and uh, the, the discount, the loan discount could be, a full, could be fully utilized uh, you know, to, to better differentiate service providers. Uh, if we make investment cost to be super high or demand to be super low, then basically it makes no sense to expansion. So it's better that uh, we let go the investment, uh, the, the growth opportunity. And this is the case uh, without pooling. But if we look at the case uh, with uh, what we call general pooling, uh, in the case of general pooling, we show that sort of the lower end, when the investment cost is low, the trade-off is similar, right? Uh, at the high end, I go with employment. Uh, when at the low end, I go with uh, financing. But when I when the investment cost is high, in this case, a uh, rental actually dominate both. A uh, rental dominate financing mostly because. Uh, in the uh, in rental uh, mechanism, I could allow uh, asset pooling, right? When the investment is cost is high, asset pooling becomes more beneficial. And uh, when the demand uh, is high, the trade-off is basically uh, between uh, rental and uh, employment. As mentioned, the rental ply, the rental price, is uh, a largely reflects sort of market demand. So when market demand is high, the rental de the rental price is also high, right? That allows the service the platform to recoup a lot of the investment cost, and making rental more profitable compared to uh, employment. So uh, put it differently, when the demand is very high, a uh, rental basically provide an additional lever to sort of extract a surplus from uh, from service providers. How, how did I raise my own hand? Okay. Sorry, give me a second. Lower hand. I don't know why, what, what had triggered my own hand. But yeah, I, I could stop here a little bit. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Is there any, oh, any question? All right. So uh, with that, let me uh, sort of move on uh, to the... Uh, so, so we have another uh, mechanism where we sort of... Uh, we call we endogenalize uh, the pooling level, which means uh, the inconvenient cost is a function of uh, the pooling, uh, the pooling uh, uh, parameter gamma, right? And the relationship between the inconvenience cost and gamma captures is follows this uh, uh, this this uh, formula. So here, the tuning parameter mu allows us to capture when pooling is efficient, which means I could go with a very low gamma without increasing mu by a lot or when pooling is inefficient. And by comparing these two, basically show the result is, uh, it's, it's sort of similar, they carry uh, similarly with uh, the results with, uh, uh, with fixed pooling level, right? And uh, finally, uh, as mentioned before, we're looking at two expansions, uh, two extensions. One is minimum wage regulation. This is uh this is motivated by uh a few regulations proposed both in Europe and in the US, U.S. in particular California that tries to protect uh, uh, the rights of these service providers. 
So uh, what we have shown here is basically a uh, minimum wage could expand the region that uh, rental is preferred because it, it basically sets a, 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 the, the, a minimum uh, level that uh, the service provider has to be paid. Well, the rental price itself, as mentioned before, it was uh, largely governed by market demand. And uh, we show that uh, th this is somewhat counterintuitive for us that moderate uh, minimum wage could actually enhance both platform profit and uh, service provider surplus, right? There was this argument that minimum wage works uh, for the service providers at the expense of platform. But what we have shown is that when the minimum wage is set at a moderate level, it actually be, uh, be providing a win-win solution. This is precisely because uh, that by committing to a minimum or by having the ability to commit to a minimum wage uh, as imposed by the government or by the regulator, uh, a service uh, the service pro, pro, uh, the service platforms actually has additional lever to commit to uh, uh, to for commitment that allows the holdout problem to be alleviated. And uh, the final extension we looked at is uh, indirect network effect, uh, which is a salient feature, arguably a, a very important feature in two sided platforms, which says basically. Once you have more demand, you should have more supply. On the other hand, once you have more supply, you should be able to attract more uh, demand, for example, because uh, the, ser the the customers expect a lower waiting time. So because in this paper, we are focusing more on the supply side, so we're capturing the indirect network effect through, uh, uh, sort of we are building that in through this direction. We're saying that, if you have more service provider, this actually is going to generate higher demand. And uh, what we have shown here is that when the network effect is high, in general, uh, you would prefer employment and rental, right? Uh, this again is uh, consistent with our earlier result, which we say that uh, de when demand is high, employment and rental is better employment and rental is better. And in this case, a, a higher network effect basically means a service capacity expansion will generate additionally more uh, demand and thus uh, better. Uh, so making uh, employment and rental uh, more beneficial. Uh, with this, I think that's uh, all the results that I'm going to present today. Uh, so in summary, we looked at a problem that faced by a common problem, I would argue, for uh, uh, digital platforms when they're trying, once they have already exploited idle capacity, existing capacity, and then they try to feel further growth. And the idea is we have service providers, uh, but without the service capacity. So how do we actually better enable uh, the expansion of service capacity. Uh, we looked at, we show that in the benchmark model where the platform is not actively engaged in the platform expansion decision, uh, once the service providers borrow directly from the bank, it results in both underinvestment and underutilization. We show that at a very high level of the three mechanisms, uh, the service provider, the uh, sir, uh, the platforms uh, have trialed financing, employment, and rental all have their place. Right? Uh, we show platform financing could uh, alleviate both underinvestment and uh, underutilization, but they require payment tied to on-platform activity. So arguably, the the contract is. Is is more uh, is more complicated. We show that at high level, the the optimal mechanism so basically balances the commitment power, uh, the flexibility it leaves to the service provider, and the benefit of asset pooling. Uh, through the two extensions, we show that minimum wage regulation could actually benefit a growing platform. Uh, especially, uh, especially under the financing uh, region, especially under the financing 
uh, mechanism because it provides this additional commitment device. And uh, we show that strong network effect benefits uh, employment and uh, more on employment, but also marginally on uh, rental. So uh, with this, that's uh, all I have for today. And uh, the paper is available on SSRN, as mentioned uh, during the presentation. Uh, we're currently revising the, the paper and we're trying to add more uh, sort of features that could better capture uh, uh, sort of bridge the, the model with reality. Uh, so far, the results are, are encouraging. So basically, the, the, the qualitative results remain the same, but uh, we also get more nuanced, uh, sort of more nuanced results here. Uh, I shall stop here. Uh, Andrea, I'm happy to take uh, further questions or take questions offline. Okay, Felix has another question, please. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Felix, please. Thank you again for the presentation. Um, I was uh, trying to understand the, the dynamics. Um, and so um, often with the, um, so often you see with the service providers that they use in-house or employee drivers and crowdsourced drivers. That was, uh, Andrea was mentioning that there's a mix. And um, yes. my thinking always was that the crowdsourced drivers, their advantage is that they can uh, pool working for different companies. And so if they do not have work from one company, can use it from another platform and co combine that. Did you somehow take that effect into account, the fact that they can create synergies by working for multiple companies? Uh, um, in some sense, I'm, I'm not sure how that could translate into the model, but just conceptually. Right. Uh, so a, a couple of comments. One is, uh, even though we don't consider the new providers uh, as a mix between crowdsourced and employed, uh, we, we do have two types of uh, service providers, right? So in a way, we consider the existing service providers, they are all crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. And the new providers, they are either completely crowdsourced or completely uh, employed, right? Uh, so, so, so that's just a simple clarification. The second question you are saying about uh, whether if they are cross-sourced, whether they can multi-home, right? Uh, in our model, we, we don't model uh, multi-homing explicitly, but we do allow the service providers to have an alternative, right? Their outside option. The outside option is sort of captures that a little bit, but are, are admittedly, it doesn't capture the strategic uh, play, interplay between platforms, right? So there is more sort of an exogenous, uh, exogenous shock. So, so that there is limitations there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. I okay. see one thank on you. the chat. Oh, okay, Christine, thank you. <laughs> she was thanking you. Okay, so great. Thank you, Alex, for your great presentation. And... Uh, Hope to see you next year in some conference. So um, sure. thanks to all the participants to the webinar. Uh, the next one is uh, has been scheduled on uh, December 19, just before Christmas time. And Richard Toll will present a paper on physical and transition risk of climate change. So um, thanks again, wherever you are in the world. Have a nice day, afternoon or evening and uh, see you later. Bye-bye. All right, thank you.